What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV, back here for yet another Tottenham update where we're going to go deep into the last 24 hours of Tottenham news. If you don't know by now, check us out on podcasting platforms such as Spotify and also check out our website, wearetottenhamtv.com for your latest articles and merchandise as well. But let's get into the Tottenham update and let's start off with that Timo Werner story once again. Um, I think it's no secret by now uh, what this story is going to be. We've covered it a number of times and it's Matt Law this time talking about it and he says Timo Werner has already told allies that he wants to stay at Tottenham Hotspur on a permanent basis. Spurs have an option to buy him permanently for around 14 and a half million with the clause expiring by the start of Euro 2024 so a quick decision by Tottenham will have to be made. Um, I think we We've literally covered this story to death, but because it's a new journalist talking about it, I thought I'd better add it in. But me personally, I've said it time and time again, I'm not particularly sure that he's the right fit for Tottenham. I think that from a playing style point of view, he's all right, but I do think we need to be going um, for a higher quality player. But he has until the end of the season to change my mind. It's interesting. He told allies where where he wants to be next season. Well, I wonder what he's telling his enemies. <laughs> I'm wondering. But, he's telling uh, his enemies he wants to go to Chelsea. <laughs> exactly. But um, one thing I like about Timo is how he's fitted in. Obviously, he's a very likable character and he's clearly very popular amongst the dressing room. Now, these things do matter when it comes to um, how a player is going to settle in and how much you want to keep them around. And I do think that plays into his favour how he has settled in at Spurs and that confidence boost it's given him and clearly. He's quite popular around the dress room. And obviously at 14 and a half million price tag, it's hard to turn that down considering he is a good deal for a player of, of, of Timo Werner's quality. But as, as we've pointed out, um, I'm just not 100% convinced um, yet. I'm not convinced yet that, that um, he's definitely not the right guy, but I'm just not convinced that he can take us to the next level of where we want to go under Ange. I think he's really great. If if you want, if we want to just keep, you know, challenging for top four and getting those Champions League spaces and battling the higher echelons, we're not quite, um, you know, get, uh, make it over the line when it comes to trophies like we were in previous seasons. And I think Timo Werner would be a good signing. But if we really want to push the bow and, and challenge that top three at the moment and really... Um, um, muscle our way in there and say we are serious about next season I just don't know if Timo Werner is the kind of player that will take us to the next level but as I say if it is Werner plus another one um, I do think uh, if that other player is very very good and 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 is a real upgrade then maybe it's good then, uh, that would be acceptable but at this current moment in time I think Werner is a good player I think he's he does he's doing well at the moment, but I don't think signing him permanently is going to benefit us long term. Yeah, I think that could change if he just smashes it from now until the end of the season. He's already got four goal contributions in seven, and let's say he impacts to the uh, play really well, and on top of that, he gets um, you know quite a good number of goal contributions from now until the end of the season. I think my opinion can change on him, but even if he does do that, I would still like to see um, additional wingers brought in alongside him, and him being not our star winger, but a squad winger. I think as a squad winger, I think he is good enough. But in terms of our star winger starting week in, week out on that left-hand side, I do think we need better quality, even if he does smash it from now until the end of the season. But that is Timo Werner. Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Let's talk about Pedro Porro now. We do have some quotes on Pedro, but we've got a quote from a journalist or a uh, source Ekrem Konar who's not exactly the most reliable journalist on the scene and he says Real Madrid are interested in Pedro Porro Tottenham can listen to offers of over 55 million euros and seeing as we did sign in for 45 million euros uh, last January um, I think we can just stay say first and foremost that this um, is absolute rubbish <laughs> 55 million is absolutely no chance uh, that a deal would be done, especially for a number of different factors. First of all, he's playing really well. He's one of our most important players right now on the back line. Um, good right backs right now are hard to come by of his quality. Uh, and as you say, we signed him for 40 million. So I think we're going to be make, trying to make a bit more than a 15 million profit on him. Um, and if we do sell him for 55, who are we going to get who's as good as him? So, And, he's, and he seems happy here. Uh, which I guess we'll go into with the quotes in a bit. But I think all those put together, 
tell me there is very little opportunity, very little chance that 55 million is priced. The only the only way Spurs sell him is if he's obviously if Madrid come in for him, he's angling for a move because obviously he's you know he gets his head turned by the bright lights of Real Madrid. He starts pushing for it, and then maybe it comes to a point where Spurs have to accept. Look, he really wants to go. He's had his head turned, and we have to find an acceptable offer. But that offer is not going to be 55 million. It's going to be close to like. 75 80 million probably yeah. so um unless madrid are willing to go that high on a right back i don't think that this deal was anywhere close to if, happening if you're not minimum doubling your money there is no point of even entering into conversations and i get what you're saying you know if he does get his head turned he's spanish at the end of the day um and it is quite possible that he could ha have his head turned by a team like real madrid but i think just because he's not been at spurs for too long he seems very happy he's uh, just about you know having his breakout season now after a hard start well, let's say for him at life at Tottenham but look it is uh, very clear that Real Madrid are looking for a right back they've um, I think they've been heavily linked with Trent Alexander-Arnold today in the press with Fabrizio Romano talking about it so I think Ekrem Konar is just coming out and saying oh Real Madrid are looking for a right back why not Les Lincoln for Pedro Porro I don't really think there's anything in this mm. um, in terms of the quotes he was first talking about the criticism during the beginning period at Tottenham and he says obviously nobody likes criticism but in this world, you're exposed to good and bad things being said about you. At the end of the day, you don't care as long as you are confident in yourself. I knew that I was going to get a lot of criticism and that I was going to be hard, that it was going to be hard at first. Not everyone is perfect and goes in fits, um, goes and in fits in the team. Um, now I've been working really hard to turn that criticism into praise. And now I'm feeling more affection. And then he went on to talk about the improvement this season. He says, it's different from when I arrived. Now I feel more important in the team. I feel much more confident that at the end of the day also makes you feel better. I'm feeling much better more and more as the games go by. I'm more used to playing in the Premier League and that is the most important thing. And um, I think that's absolutely spot on. You know, he had a very hard, tough time uh, when he did first break into the team. You all remember that debut against Leicester where he got absolutely torn apart. Um, and then I think since Ange Postacoglu's come in, since getting to grips with this new system that he's been playing an inverted right-back role, which he's never played in the past, I think he's just come on leaps and bounds. His defensive... Uh, uh, displays have been growing week on week and his attacking displays have been there for all to see you know c going into the middle of the park dictating the tempo of the play and using his brilliant ball playing ability uh, to the best of his abilities so as much as Fulham was probably his worst performance of the season I do think by and large he's had an unbelievable season for Spurs yeah I think he's not just been um, one of our best players but I think in the league I think when it comes to right backs he's right up there for um uh, a case for right back of the season I think he's been that consistent and that good and I think he's being very harsh on himself I think everyone re remembers that debut against Leicester and how he struggled in that game and maybe as well you take into account the Newcastle game where obviously the, the whole team was all over the place but I think I think anyone who was watching Spurs week and week out could tell that that guy had quality even last season he was already getting goal contributions last season I think he ended the season with like three goals and two assists or something like that yeah. or two goals and three assists like he was already starting to get goal contributions but obviously um, Spurs was just a bit of a mess and I, for me it was no surprise that once he came into a settled team who um, wanted to play on the front foot that he was going to shine and he's done that this season and he looks so much freer he looks so much more confident as well with his ability to like he's not afraid to make a mistake for a pass because he knows he's got the quality to uh, pick out a pass in a dangerous position and that is something that he's really really great at and um, I've, I've absolutely been um, really impressed with him this season I'm so happy that he's finally um, found that a consistent high level of performance and become that right back we all hoped he, he could be so um, I'm delighted by his quotes and I think uh, maybe Tim Sherwood should owe him an apology at this point yeah what did Tim Sherwood say again well Sherwood said uh, he doubled down on it He when he first saw him he said um, he was one of the worst performances he's ever seen and this guy's going to be a flop he couldn't believe Spurs paid 40 million for him and then recently I think it was a few weeks ago he was asked about those comments do you want to take does he want to take anything back and he was like no I still think he's suspect defensively and I still think they overpaid for him I was like oh my god Tim just admit you got something wrong for god's sake um and I, I think Poro's proving a lot of people wrong this season I swear Tim Sherwood is the biggest embarrassment of a journalist ever like you see those quite the the thing pundit. with Cole Palmer pundit yeah. you know the thing with um Cole Palmer yeah. like well, the questions he was asking him like even as like a Spurs fan it makes me laugh like 
doing that to Cole Palmer, but still, like, as a pundit, you can't be saying those things on live TV. It's ridiculous. Like, yeah. how uncomfortable was that? Yeah, I was really, I was cringing a lot watching that, as if Palmer's going to say, yeah, my whole team are rubbish, mate. Absolutely <laughs> right. I need a whole new team. It's like, come on. Uh, you got to ask smarter questions. But yeah, Tim has been, the thing with Tim Sherwood is he speaks his mind. So I do appreciate that approach, but uh, his mind isn't anything to be taken seriously. So there you go. <laughs> 100%. Um, let's talk about Eve Basuma now. This is um, a strange one, in my opinion. So Alistair Gold broke the news this morning, says 27-year-old Spurs man was not among the 28-player squad announced by the Malian Football Federation for their March internationals against Mauritania and Nigeria. Basuma struggled for game time at the AFCON under coach Eric Shell, having suffered from a bout of malaria before the tournament began. Now, Shell has dropped Basuma from his latest squad, quoted and explaining to the media after the squad was announced. Like many players, he deserves to be selected. It's just a choice. In my diamond, there are many players right now who are slightly safe, safer than Eve Basuma. That doesn't mean he won't be called again. Uh, since then, some reports in Mali have claimed that Basuma has reacted furiously to being dropped from uh, the Mali squad and has deleted all references for playing for his country from his Instagram account, as well as claiming that he has unfollowed the Mali Football Federation on the platform. So um, something doesn't seem to be all right with Yves Basuma in the Malian uh, Football Federation. Clearly. Um, look, if I was Basuma, obviously I'd also be angry, but I'd also have to realise that maybe it's a consequence of not just, just not being in the best form recently, to be honest, and he hasn't been in the best form for a few uh, few months now, and that, that is a reality we all have to face. As much as I love Basuma as a player, and I think at his very best, he's one of the best um, defensive mids in the league, um, he hasn't been at that level, and that is the reality. Um, so maybe as much as he's annoyed at Marley, maybe he's annoyed at himself, uh, and he's maybe um, projecting that, that, that feeling onto Marley because they've decided to leave him out. Um, obviously, with him, he knows, you know, look, he's playing at Tottenham, one of the big biggest teams in, in, in the league. And, you know, he's starting pretty much week in, week out. So he f should feel like, look, if I'm playing at this kind of level, why am I being left out for centre mids who probably aren't playing for such big clubs and um, sort of at, at that kind of level as well? So I understand that that frustration. He probably feels like he's uh, they're one of their main players and he, should, and he maybe feels disrespected uh, by the fact he's been left out. Um, maybe, I'm just hoping this can be some sort of turn turning point for him to wake up and hopefully turn things around because um, it hasn't been great for him for, for, for a while now. But um, you're right, it's, uh, something clearly is uh, not right there with that situation. I don't know if he's got an argument with the manager or, or it's just a consequence of his bad form. But let's hope maybe two weeks um, uh, with back with Ange um, it, on the training ground, hopefully they can get to the bottom of uh, why his form has um, taken a decline. You'd even think though, like even with the form he's on, I know it was a really poor performance against Fulham, but we sat here and we were saying that like, we've seen improvements in Basuma's performances over the recent weeks. Fulham aside, you know, against that Crystal Palace game, the game before that as well, we were praising Yves Basuma's performances, right? So do you think this is totally down to the form that he's on? Because it's not exactly... He hasn't fallen off a cliff. You know, he hasn't been the worst player in the world. He's still showing good defensive capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, I, I, that's a good point. Um, I don't know if it's completely down to form. What I would be saying is, it, what I would say is, if he'd been, been been performing like he had in his first 10 games for the rest... It'd be too hard to ignore. Yeah, exactly. Would they drop him? I don't yeah. think they Then they could justify dropping him. Now they've got some sort of justification that, he's slightly, that he is out of form. And maybe they've taken that and maybe there is a problem between him and the coach and they use that as an excuse not to use him and he's taken that as a sign of disrespect. So, look, I could read all day into it. Obviously, you've got to take the manager's word for why he's been left out. But um, if I'm Basuma, obviously, I'm going to be frustrated. But hopefully he sees this as an opportunity to self-reflect. Yeah, I hope so. And I hope that, you know, these couple of weeks on the training ground with Ange will really stand him in good stead and he comes back for, in the, against that Luton game and uh, comes back in firing form for Eve Basuma that we did see in the first 10 games of the season. But we've also been talking a lot about, well, I have personally, about Basuma's confidence being knocked after those red cards. We haven't seen the same Basuma's again since that first 10 games. I mean, this ain't going to do much for his confidence, is it? No, but looking by his activity, maybe that anger will put a bit of fire in his belly. And I hope maybe, so. And maybe that could spark something in, in in a way. So, yes, I don't think from a confidence point of view, being left out for your country is a good thing. But if it does put that fire in his belly and he starts to play with that bit more anger and a bit more swagger, 
maybe that could help him. That's what I'm trying to think of positives. I hope so. I hope so. I guess all will be revealed against Luton in uh, just over a week's time. Let's reflect on the international games from last night. Wales beat Finland by four goals to one. Brennan scored and played 73 minutes in Wales' 4-1 victory over Finland. Ben Davis captained the side and played 90 minutes on the night. Had a goal ruled out for offside as well in a massive win for Wales in the semi-final of the playoffs. Yeah, impressive. Um, really glad that Brendan Johnson's continuing his club form into his uh, playing for his country, albeit uh, from what I gather he plays a slightly different position. He's playing like the number nine position mm. for Wales, whereas obviously for Tottenham, has he ever played there for us yet? I don't, no. I don't think he's had one appearance there for us. So has to adjust. Um, from what I was seeing from the game, he did have a bit of struggle, like adjusting to that position, but obviously he did get his goal. It was a nice poacher's finish at uh, the back post. Good movement, um, good like a reading of where the ball was going to drop and obviously finished it off. Um, so really happy for him and for Wales. Hopefully they, they, they win. Who they got in the final? So they play uh, Poland. Poland. It's going to be a difficult game. So this weekend then? Yeah, I think Probably so. Yeah. this weekend. So good luck to him. Uh, let's hope he... Um, carries on his goal scoring form but that'll just that, that's really good though because it'll keep him ticking over when he comes back to Spurs with, with, with his confidence um, being sky high yeah and the goal he scored is very kind of reminiscent of the goals that he has been scoring with Spurs you know mm. cross at the back post nice open goal uh, but his positional play has been spot on hasn't it yeah and that's something clearly he's been working on with Angelot and it's paying off now he's getting he's starting to get goals regularly from it Portugal 5, Sweden 2. Dejan Kulisevsky played 90 minutes, regis registering an assist in a 5-2 loss for Sweden against Portugal. And they did try a new system, Sweden, in this game. Jokerez played up front. I think Kulisevsky was on the right, Alanga was on the left, and Isaac was in behind in the number 10, but Portugal absolutely tore them to shreds. But albeit, I believe that Dejan Kulisevsky was one of the shining lights for Sweden. I've only seen the highlights of this game, but whenever Sweden um, were creating chances because FC seemed to be right at the heart of it. Um, he, I, I saw a couple of times he did a really good high press, winning the ball uh, in um, uh, Portugal's defensive third and making opportunities. He had a shot from the right-hand side, which unfortunately dragged wide, could have done a bit better, better with. But his his um, assist was really good. Um, uh, it was actually at 5-1, so it didn't really mean much, but did really well to cut inside on his left, put a peach of a cross to the back post, and one of the strikers headed it in uh, at the back post with a nice looping header. So really nice assist from, from Decky. Uh, from what I saw... Um, Portugal did run right but it was a series of uh, defensive errors from mm. uh, Sweden which uh, maybe they're just adjusting it to, to that new system I mean when you look at that front line Isaac Kulisevsky Jokerez and um, Alanga. Alanga I mean that is a very good front line so if they can get that defence sorted like they could have a very bright future Sweden yeah it's just a shame about the rest of the team but the front yeah. line is looking good for Sweden and finally Italy beat Venezuela by two goals to one Destiny Udogi played 90 minutes in a comprehensive display at left wing back for the Azzurri uh, Vicario was an unused sub and it does and maybe um doesn't look like he's going to get his start because Donnarumma did save a penalty. And I think I saw a stat yesterday, something crazy about Donnarumma. Like he saved like over 70% of penalties he's faced as Italy um, goalkeeper, that's which is thing. nuts. I don't know how true that, that is, but that's a stat I saw doing the rounds on Twitter yesterday. Stat, like 70%. I know. That's ridiculous. It's mad. Um, maybe, maybe he's only faced about three penalties. But <laughs> um, in terms of a doggy's uh, stats, 54 out of 57 passes completed, eight passes into the final third, two dribbles completed most of any player on the pitch three out of three accurate long balls one interception seven ball recoveries five out of ten ground jewels one and two fouls one as well and um he he received rave reviews last night yeah it's great news and it's only going to help him grow as a player if he's going to be starting regularly for his national team especially italy who you know have quite a lot of uh, decent fullbacks and 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 a few good left backs as well so the fact that he's getting there ahead of the competition and 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 doing well once he gets that opportunity is only going to benefit him from our point of view when he gains that confidence of, of being an Italy international and taking that in, into when Spurs come back. So that's really great news and let's hope he goes from strength to strength for Italy. Yep. And a host of Tottenham players making their way out for internationals this weekend. I did say yesterday on the update what's coming up tonight, but I'll reaffirm it's a Pat Mate Saar playing at 7.30 tonight against Gabon for Senegal. Radu Dragusin is playing Northern Ireland at home in a friendly for Romania. Pedro Porro could be playing against Colombia tonight at 8.30 for Spain. 
um, which is actually in England. So luckily he doesn't have much traveling to do. Midnight tonight, Giovanni Lo Celso and Cuti Romero for Argentina against El Salvador in the USA. Troy Parrott could be playing for Republic of Ireland at home against Belgium tomorrow, 5 p.m. England against Brazil, 7 p.m. tomorrow, which uh, Madison and Richarlison could be going head to head. And Richarlison actually had some fighting talk for uh, Madison before the game as well. Rodrigo Bentancor could be playing against the Basque Country for Uruguay at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Hoybier uh, could be playing for Denmark against Switzerland tomorrow, 7 p.m. And then on Sunday, it's Italy against Ecuador, where Destiny Adogi and potentially Vicario could be lining up on Sunday. And then Deki against uh, Albania for Sweden on Monday and night at 6 p.m. So that is your Tottenham update for today. Let me know in the comment section below your thoughts regarding all the news stories we brought to you today. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come, come on, on you Spurs.